turn to Romans 12, parents, teenagers, as we finish up right relationships, mean right living. We talked about God last week and, and our relationship with him. And for anything else to be right in our life, I really believe that our relationship with God must be right. Because he sets the tone. He, he puts things in order. He, he gives us priority and stacks things just the way it should be. Anything else above God makes our priorities wrong. It makes our life wrong, and it's out of balance. And we struggle, and we, we have a difficult time with that. And so today I want to look at, now, last week we looked at knowing God and getting our relationship right with him. Now we have to have a right relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And even in, in the way that we approach and we befriend those that don't like us very much, the ones that we call enemies, I guess. But I think with God, they may be our enemy, they may consider ourselves our enemy, but we should never consider another man or another woman our enemy because God has showed us how to love. He showed us how to care for each other and how to do these things. Pick up with me at verse 1. We'll just read back through that, but... Something the Lord just spoke to me while Danny was singing there. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, just last week, we talked about this, and we talked about the sacrifice part. But what just hit me is, through God's grace, we get to be a living sacrifice. What, what do you know about all other sacrifices? They die. They die. They had to give their life to be a sacrifice. The Lord is so good to us, and his grace is so rich to us, guys. Yes, he asked us to give ourselves to him, but guess what? We get to go on living. We didn't have to die on the cross for our sins. We didn't have to get up on an altar and pay the ultimate price. We had someone do that for us. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. My chains are gone. I can live now. I can live in a world that is is being destroyed by sin. I can live in a world where brother hates brother and sister hates sister and daughter hates mama. I can live in a world and we can share the good news and we can be a living sacrifice to God and show people what it's really about when you give your heart to Christ, how sweet it can be. And there is a way through and around and into eternity with Christ. Man. In view of God's mercy to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Lord, please let me be holy and pleasing to you. This is your true and proper worship. This is the least we can do. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. You want to know what God's will is? You want to know how to please God? Guys, we are still living our life to please God. We are still living our life in order to get enough check marks to get to heaven. But living for God is just doing what he asks. Doing what he asks us to do. Being obedient to that. It's not trying to win his favor. We've already got his favor. He created us. He created us. He sent his only begotten son to die for us. You can't get anybody's favor any more than that. So just live for him now. Just live for him. We are bound by so many chains, and grace, grace took those chains away. Just live for him. Quit trying to make it so hard. Just live for Christ. He's going to give you the power to do it. He's going to give you the know-how to do it. Right here, we got the instruction book. He's given us the power of prayer that we can speak to him any day that we want and come into the presence of a holy God. Mm. We take him for, for granted, don't we? We take him pretty lightly. We take him for something that we can just pick up and talk to and then set it back down. He didn't want that. Is that the way you want your kids to treat you? Just talk to you whenever, or when I get time, or I'll see you in a few years. No. I want to hear from my kids every day. I want to hear from my kids all the time. God wants to hear from you. 
He wants to show you how to live. He don't want to beat you over the head. He wants to show you how to do it right. He wants to instruct you in the right ways. He wants to have you an abundant life. Do you want all that you can possibly have for your kids? You better believe it. How much more than does God want you to have all that you can have? And I'm not talking about dollars and cents here. I'm talking about a free and wonderful life, an abundant life, a life that's not full of strife all the time, a life that you're not at each other's throat all the time. That's what he wants us to do. As we look down through here, as we continue now into our second part, humble service in the body of Christ, our second relationship is with others. And here's Paul talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ. Read with me there, 3 through 16. For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. We have different gifts according to the gift, according to the grace given each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. He said, look, just as your body, just as you're made up, we're not all one arm. It looked pretty funny if we looked up and here's, here's, comes a big arm walking down the road, you know? Or here's a, here, one guy's a big toe, you know? There's a, there's a guy that looks like a big toe. You know, it's, just, it's ridiculous. And God said, that's the way it is with the body of Christ. We're not just, we're not just one person. We're, we're many members. There's many parts here. There's arms and legs and hearts and, and all these things. And he starts telling you, look, just like that, the church, the church is many members. Don't think of yourself any higher than the other. There's a couple of things that go on in the church with our gifts. First of all, sometimes we over-evaluate ourselves. We go, man, if I don't do it, it's just not going to get done right. Man, I am the only one that can teach that class. I am the only one. I'm the only one that can mow that yard just right. I'm the only one that knows how to do it. If, if I don't do it, it's not. We over-evaluate ourselves. You know what I've found, guys? There's none of us replaceable. I mean, there's none of us that's not replaceable. That's what I meant to say. You all knew what I said. There's not any of us that are... And listen, we're all... Listen, I, I love all of us. But listen to me. God's, God's church and God's glory and God's service and his job, it's going to get done. It's going to get done. I worked up there at that paint store for 20 years. I went in there and sold paint every day. And man, I thought, man, when I walk out of here, there's, you know, I got so much in my mind and things I know, and I, I can remember things, and I know who did this 10 years ago, and, you know, I, I just don't know if they can make it or not. You know what they're still doing up there at 1604 Caraway Road? They're selling paint. They're still selling paint, man. And, and listen, and I'm not saying, just say, well, I'm not important, so somebody else can do my job. I'm not saying that. But don't, what, this is what he said, don't think of yourself more higher than you ought. Guys, listen, there's none of us here except by the grace of God. Amen? And he's given us a great gift. Sometimes you've got some kind of gift. You're not here because, well, I just always went to Kaiser or, you know, some of my friends go here, so I thought I'd start going here. You're not here by accident this morning. You're not a member of this church by accident. We need all of us. There's a big job to do. If you hadn't looked around lately, there's a lot of lost people out there. Amen? There's a lot of people hurting and don't know how to get their way through this crazy world. And we know. We know. What hurts my heart, Danny was telling me earlier, you know, what, you know what you always hear? Well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in organized religion. Why don't they believe in organized religion? Because of us. Because how we treat each other. Because how we argue. Because we're sitting there in a the cubicle at work, and we can't even agree on how you're supposed to be baptized. Well, some say you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus, and some guy got to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Is that not the same person? And the people over here sitting in the other corner are lost. And we can't even, we're sitting there arguing our denominational differences and, and our legalistic differences. What Bible you teach out of? Well, hey, I'm King James only. 
That's the only Bible to have. You use it. NIV or you use it. Oh my goodness. That, you know, that's that's terrible. They're to shut down your church. You're evil. And people sitting over here lost. And they hear that. And they go, those folks can't even agree on which Bible to read. Why do I want to go to church there? That's the reason why people are struggling with church. It's because of us. Because we evaluate ourselves a little higher than we ought to. We are sinners saved by grace at best. Amen? We're sinners saved by grace. And I'm not here to degrade us. I'm not here to degrade you this morning because we're something in Christ. Christ thought we were worth everything. Christ thought we were worth his only begotten son. You, know, you understand that? We are worth something in Christ. But guys, we have got to get along. And, and listen, I am the most blessed pastor. I'm not, I'm not just, you know, just rubbing your back this morning. I am the most blessed pastor. This church, is, it's been very good at, at getting along. I hear some of the things going on, and I said, man, I'm running back to Mississippi County and staying there as long as I can. I appreciate that. But I also know there's work to be done, amen? We're never there. We've never arrived. We can always do more for each other. We've got to have each other's back. We've got families that are hurting right now, guys. We can't just go close up in our own little home and our own little self and forget those out there that are hurting. People that sat right here on these chairs just weeks ago are facing death. And we got, we got to show the love to them. And when people see that, then, you know, it's like Danny said, one of these days, if we can really show them how to love, well, I don't know about God, but I know what they got down in that church is real. Because then they got to come to face to face with God. But listen, let us don't be the reason they don't find God. Amen? Let our church don't be the, let it not be the reason they don't find Jesus. That's what he's saying here. And the other part of that is, some over evaluate yourself. Others of you say, well, I just don't, I don't know what I can bring to the table. I don't have any gifts. I'm not very good around people. I don't like kids very much, you know. <laughs> and guys, what you're saying is, I don't believe that God can make me into something he wants me to be. That's what you're saying. Your faith is low. So on one hand, you can over evaluate yourself and say, it just can't go on without me. We know that's not true. The other way is, I don't know, there's nothing I can do, so I'm just going to kind of sit on the sideline. Listen, every person's got something they can do for Jesus. Every person. He didn't, he didn't make no junk. He didn't make you by accident. He didn't make, well, I made 10 in a row, but that one right there, I, I don't know, I just missed out on them. I didn't give them any gifts. You've got gifts. What's it, what was some of the gifts here, guys? It's something that we forget. What do you say? If, if you can teach, teach. That's what prophesying is. If it is to serve, guys, we, can, we need to serve each other. Who had the greatest servant heart ever? Jesus Christ. It was all about others. And I see a lot of good servant hearts in this church for others, taking their time and, and, and being there for other people. I love that. It's to teach, teach. Look at this next one, guys. There is not one person in here that could not do this. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. Do you hear encouragement anywhere in our world today? Not very much. Not very much. Oh, this world needs to be encouraged. But it needs to be encouraged toward Jesus. Because he's the only hope we got. And this world is messed up. But there is hope. I don't want you to leave here today going, man, it's hopeless. There is hope. His name is Jesus. He, he gave us hope on that cross, and then he rose again to really give us hope. He's alive today and interceding for us and pleading our case to the Father. That's big. If it's to give, give generously. There he goes talking about giving again. <laughs> hey, just if you want to give, give. I'm not paid on commission here, you know. You're not paying me. You're giving to the Lord. You're giving to the Lord. I just, I'm just kind of a benefactor of that, you know? And I thank you for that. I thank you for what you do for my family. But it, it's not about money. It's about worshiping. It's about worshiping God. What's some of the others? If it's to lead, lead. If, it, if it's to show mercy, who can't show mercy? 
And guys, we are terrible at that. If you do me wrong, I'm going to give it to you, buddy. I'm going to let you know what I think. If it is to get, if it is to show mercy, show mercy. Guys, where would we be without the grace of God? We could be in the same ditch that person is at that time. We serve a God that gives you those second chances. We serve a God that gives you another hope when you've messed up. I've messed up in my life. There's a whole 10 year span from 20 to 30 that I'd like to have back. Because I had about 10 wasted years there that I could have done something big for God. But I was busy doing what Todd wanted to do. And I think we have a lot of 20 to 30 somethings that experience that, trying to find your way and, and trying to understand where life is, trying to understand what your career is, trying to find a wife or a husband or how many kids you're going to have. And that 20 to 30 gap, it's a tough one. It's a, it's a seek and find type years. But guys, listen to me. You don't have to go and seek and find by yourself. Jesus Christ will take you through that. And you can be strong for him when you're 20. Oh, wouldn't you like to have that energy again, Gary, when you're 20 years old for God? You know, that energy that you've got, that never-ending energy? Man, I get up, you know, within two hours, i got to sit back in the chair. I'm tired, you know. But to have that energy for God. But you know what, what I found, guys, I don't care whether you're 5 or 55. Energy comes from God. He is our strength, and we can do whatever we want to do for God if we want to because he'll give us the energy to do it. He will, I promise you. An honest evaluation, guys, and that's what he's talking about here. Just take an honest evaluation of where you're at. It says we are saved by grace through faith. We must serve and live by grace through faith. We talk about that all the time. We're saved by grace through faith. Well, that's not, they don't cut it off there. God just didn't save us by grace through faith and say, okay, that's all the grace and faith you get. He gives you more to serve and to use your gifts and to love each other and to, to tell people how much he loves them. He's going to continue to give you that. We take no credit in our gifts, but we thank God and give him the glory. Don't puff yourself up. Don't over-evaluate yourself. Just say, God, thank you for what you've given me. And if, listen, the only gift in the church is not singing. Well, I can't sing. I don't know what I can do. That, who cares? Make a joyful noise and serve. Make a joyful noise and encourage. Make a joyful noise and show mercy. That's what he's saying here, guys. A right relationship with each other. And guys, I know sometimes we get so aggravated and why did they do that? And what? In the, that was kind of stupid. But I've told you before, you know what I found out as I get older? Everybody don't do life like I do life. Amen? I want them to. I think I know the best way. It took me about five years to learn that, or about 55 years to learn that with my brothers and sisters. I wanted to tell them how to live. I got the best way. But you know what? They don't want to hear it. And that's the way with each other, guys. Everybody's not going to live their life the same. But we can have one ultimate goal, and that's serving God. We can have one ultimate goal. And that over, that over exceeds everything. That should be at the heart of everything we do as a church. Listen to this. When the believer, individual believers in a church know their gifts and accept them by faith and use them for God's glory, then God can bless in a wonderful way. And I believe that. If everybody's doing their part, it's kind of like the old game tug of war, you know? We had... So many on this side and so many on that side, and they're pulling the rope. If everybody in this group pulls as hard as they can pull, and in this group somebody, somebody slacks off, unless they got like five, 400-pound guys, this side's going to win, okay? Because there's a weak link. And we don't want to be the weak link. We don't want to be the weak link. We want to be there and be what God wants us to be. Let's read on. Verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. How many says life gets really hard sometimes? Everybody raise their hand. Life gets really hard. You know what it should not do is dampen our zeal for God. Is God making our life hard? No. What makes our life the best it can be? God. 
So even when life is just coming apart at the seams, and it happens sometime in our life, we should not lose our fervor for serving God. What is the first thing that happens when somebody comes up on hard times in their life? They quit coming to church. They quit being around the family. They quit being encouraged by others. And guys, I'm telling you, if you go home and sit by yourself and try to get encouragement, it's hard to get the walls to encourage you. Amen? But we think, oh, I've got this problem, and nobody's ever had this problem but me, and it's so hideous that I would be embarrassed if I went up there in church and found out about it. Well, I've got a little secret for you. We live in the day of social media. And probably about five people know it before you do. You know? Well, just honest. You can't hide from nobody anymore. And I'm telling you another secret. Every one of us has had some of those struggles in our life. And what helps us through is the strength of each other, saying, I've been through that. And God brought me through. And he'll bring you through too. Makes you want to run through a brick wall for God when somebody says that, you know? We've got to encourage each other. Don't go home and hide. If things are falling apart, if things are hard, just get that much more zeal for God. And say, devil, you are not going to defeat me because he wants you to just go home and hide. He don't want you to be encouraged by this group. And this group must be encouragers, amen? Did you know what she did? Shh, come here. Have you heard about him? Guys, we're awful at that. I don't care if we've been saved 45 years, we still love to gossip. Stop it. Stop it. When we fall flat on our face, we need to know God is a forgiving God. We need to repent truly in our heart, truly sorry what we've done, and we need to get up and we need to encourage each other and say, come on, take the ball and let's start running again for God. Do not let your sins defeat you. We are going to fall. We're going to stumble. The Bible talks about that. He said, when you fall, comma, that comma is grace, okay, by the way. Get up and go tell your brother. Do what? Because what is going to happen, your brother's going to tell you, I've been through that, or you're going to say, let me help you get through what I just went through. So he's telling us we're going to fall. He's not, he's not saying if you fall, when you fall, you will fall, comma, grace, my grace will be extended. Get up and run the ball again. Run the ball again. We feel like, man, we've, we've, we've let God down. We've sinned. We can't go on. I'm just going to stay home. It's just uh, I can't sing with any joy anymore. All those things, guys. And, and it, listen, sin eats me up too. Listen, I get up here in front of you every Sunday, but don't you think that there's, there's sometimes I have sin in my heart that, that it just crushes me? A thought I had during the week or, or something my eyes seen or something, it just, it just kills me. And I pray, Lord, forgive me of my sins before I get behind this sacred desk. But right in the middle of a sermon, the, Lord, the devil will go, remember, remember what you were thinking this week? And you're telling those people? We all fight sin. But when we do, get up, repent, and get back in the game. Get back in the game. We got to, guys. We got to. If we went home and sat down and got out of the game because we sinned, we'd all be sitting at home. And we're not coming here because we're, every Sunday I gather together the, the, the most saintly people of our community to come here. Now, if you sin, we're going to kick you out, but only the saintly people come here every Sunday. It's what people think. I can't go down there to church. Them people's all better than me. No, we're not. We come here because we're wounded and beat up. And we got scars. We got battle scars. And we need to be healed by God spiritually and mentally and physically. And then we can keep running the race. Y'all going to run with me? Let's run. Let's go. Don't let him get you down. He will. He will. Loving participation. Look at... Look at uh, Go to 11 there. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. Man, God, what are you asking? To just sit there and say, okay, God's going to take care of it. Boy, affliction gets us all stirred up. Faithful in prayer. Boy, that's huge. And share with the Lord people who are in need. Practical hospitality. 
We talked about that a little bit last Sunday night. What not to say and what to to say to people that visit our church. What not to say is, will you get out of my chair, okay? We, we kind of laughed about that. I'm telling you, I'm going to put you all on report. If somebody asks you to move out of their chair, will you come see me after church, okay? I'll, I'll bring them to the board. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But guys, show hospitality. Man, we are glad you're here. You know what they said, the number one pe thing people, it really fired people up when they left the building after they visited a church is somebody just come up and said, I am so thankful that you came here today. Now, how hard is that? I thank you for being here today. It's huge to, to, to demonstrate hospitality. To demonstrate hospitality. We've kind of lost that art. You know, we've talked about that before, but back in the day, I remember when I was little, Man, there was, moms and dads were together all the time. They were sitting there at the table drinking coffee. Of course, kids didn't, you know, we had to go in the back and play, but man, we, we got in a lot of trouble back there in the day, but man, we had a good time, you know. But hospitality, we had people over, you know. And now we just kind of stay at our house. We've kind of quit practicing hospitality. You used to have a dinner at church. Man, you, you packed the church. Dinner, I'm coming. Now people eat out all the time. No big deal. But you know why we have those dinners? It's not for you to get full. Those dinners is to practice hospitality, to be together, to laugh and joke and, and, and share hurts and share triumphs and, and just spend some time talking. Because we zoom in here a couple hours on Sunday and we're back out the door, we don't really stop and talk. To practice hospitality. We need some more of that in our world. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless those, uh, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position, do not be conceited. Man, you know what that's saying to me? Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. You, me you remember when, what got the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees all fired up? Did you hear what I hear? Jesus is over there having dinner with those prostitutes and tax collectors. The sinners. Can you believe that? Well, I wouldn't be around them people for nothing. You know what Jesus told them? It's not the well that need a doctor. It's the sick. You know what, some, you know what this world needs today to turn it around? And you know I tell you this every time. It's not the man in the White House. I'm guaranteeing you that. It is Jesus Christ. If you're waiting on the White House to make your life better, you're on the wrong track. Get behind the banner of Jesus Christ. And that's where your hope is. That's where your hope is. Loving each other. Taking care of each other. Showing love and hospitality to maybe somebody you think, well, I don't know them. Well, I, I heard what they done. They're sick. Once were you. Once were you. That's what Paul said. He said, there's, he, he listed this big long line of sinners. And he said, and, and so once was I. And he didn't, then he didn't stop there. He said, but I was the worst. I was the worst. But God turned my life around. Jesus Christ saved me. And I want everybody to know how great that feels. I don't care whether they're making $5 a year or $55 million a month. I want everybody to know how great it feels to know Jesus is saved. That's the attitude we should have. That's the attitude we should have. Then we talk a little bit about our enemies. Real quick. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. And guys, we live in a world like that. You do me wrong, I'm coming back at you. Do unto others before they do unto you. Isn't that the golden rule nowadays? Yeah, isn't that sad? Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Well, Brother Todd, there's some people that I know that I just can't live in peace with. What did it just say? If possible. But don't let the reason you're not living in peace be your fault. Okay? They, they, still got a, they still got a free will like you do. 
But what do you say there? If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, God's people, live in peace with everyone. Do not take of revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Eat him up with kindness. That's what God said. Feed your enemy if he's hungry. Well, he can get it for himself. He got himself in that mess. You forgot about grace again when you say those things. When you look down your nose at anybody, guys, you forget about grace. You forget about grace. And guys, listen. Some of the worst enemies that may come your way may be out of your very house. Amen? Some of the very toughest enemies you may have may come out of your very household when you give your heart to Jesus. And that's hard to think about. But there's a difference here about letting the cross offend people and we as Christians offend people. Because usually when we offend people out of our own, it's because of our preferences. You're not living like I think you are to live. But what we do is we back up and we present them the cross. And if they want to be mad with God, that's up between them and God. That's called the offense of the cross. When you tell people about the cross... When you say, tell the story of the good news to some people, it makes them as mad as a hornet. They're so stinking mad, they can't even stand it. Get out of here with that God stuff. Get away from me with your Bible. Get away. I don't want any part of that. And guys, that's because they're mad at Christ. Because that relationship's not been fixed. But when we stand up and say, you need to live like me, or you need to straighten up, or you, you, know, you, need, to, you need to listen to what I'm telling you, then that's us giving us our, pre our preferences on how they should live. Let the cross offend them, but don't ever let us offend them. That's what he just said. That's what he just said. Love your enemies. Feed your enemies. Tell them about Jesus. Lay it out there, man. You know, there was times in the New Testament the Lord said them to shake the dust off and go on down the road. And boy, that's tough. But now, we don't go, hey, you need to accept Jesus. Well, they didn't accept Jesus. I'm going down the road. You want to continue to help and continue to lead. But there may be a time when you have to move on to something else, when they just scream at you and holler at you and say, I don't want any part of that. And usually I've noticed, guys, once you ask them about their salvation, you know what they're going to do next? They're going to start watching your life. I've had this happen in mine. I asked a person once, why do you believe that? And I wasn't, I just wanted to know. It was so different from what I believed. I, I wasn't going to judge. I just wanted to know, why do you believe that? Oh, man, they, well, I'm not going to be some sheep that follows blindly and follows this God thing and blah, 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 blah. But two years down the road, that same person said, could you do me a favor? My child is there in your area. Could you make sure they go to church? Hmm. But I know what happened. She wanted to see if I was the real deal. She began to watch my Facebook post and things of that nature, watching what I said, what I did, who I, who I, stripped down and who I talk bad about. And the minute you get in that tussle, that tussle, that fight, and it's usually one of your family members, they're going to begin to watch you. And guys, you have got to be that peculiar person that God asks us to be. You've got to be different than the world because they're watching. And if you're screaming and fighting and cussing and tearing everybody down, they're going to dust their feet off and walk away from you because they, what you got is not real, and they don't need no part of it. They live in a fake world anyway. And so when your enemies come calling, and they will, 
And, and listen, Jesus said in his own words, read in Matthew, red letters. You've got to love me more than you love your dad. You've got to love me more than you love your mom. You've got to love me more than you love your kids. God, I don't know if I can do that or not. I love my kids a bunch. But what he's saying, when you get that relationship right with me, I'll show you how to love your kids like you never loved them before. I'll show you the right way to love your kids. That's what he's saying. He's not saying I'm going to rip you away from them and tell them just to leave and you're a Christian now and you don't want no part of them. He said, I'll teach you how to love right. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not self-seeking. It is not rude. He said, you can have everything in the world, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. And I'm talking about God's love, not the lust of this world that we've called and we've counterfeited as love. It's tough. But you get your relationship right with God, and you get your relationship right with your church. And that third one's not always easy. But if you'll ask God to help you, he'll use you as a testimony of your family. Guys, there's nothing sweeter in this world than leading your family members to Christ. You'll remember it the rest of your life. The day me and Mr. Bill went over and seen Connie and Robert give their heart to Jesus, I'll never forget it. They had prayed and prayed and prayed for that girl for 35 years. And she got it. That light bulb went on, and she got it. And she said, I want Jesus. I'll never forget, Robert's over here behind us. We was really concentrating on Connie. And Robert said, me too. Me too. It's sweet. It's sweet to see your family come to know Christ. Do not give up hope. You live the best life possible in front of them. And let God be the revenge maker. What do you say? Vengeance is mine. Let me... He said, what he says, when you fight your own battle, you're saying, I can't handle it. When you fight your own battles, you're saying, God, you can't handle this part. I know how to, I know how to get revenge better than you, God. You can't handle this. And God says, what do you just say? Let me do the revenge. Let me take care of the things that need to be taken care of. You just keep loving. And you keep trusting me. Grace, grace. Marvelous grace. Grace that is greater than all I'm saying. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for who you are. Lord, just keep teaching me. I know I'm hard-headed, but Lord, just keep teaching us. Lord, you give, you've gifted us, everyone, and each of us has a role we can play in this kingdom. Lord, help us not to look at ourselves bigger than we should or not less than we should, but help us look into your eyes and see us through your eyes and what you see is righteousness through Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for us as Christians that we can get along, that we can can watch what we're saying in the workplace. And Lord, when we want to argue the Bible and things like that, we will find places to do that that are not in front of people that are lost. Lord, I pray for the lost in our families. Lord, there's nothing that breaks our heart more than to see our family members that don't know you. And Lord, I know there's people in this room that's paid, prayed for family members for, for decades. Lord, some have seen those prayers answered. Others are still praying those prayers. And Lord, I pray they will continue to, to be fervent in their prayer and Lord, continue to look to you. And Lord, also to continue to live the life in front of them so that someday they may find their way to you. Lord, help us to have right relationships. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If you have prayer requests, need to contact us, or need directions to the church, check us out online at fbckaiser.com. If you want to join us, we're located at 210 East Main Street, or give us a call at 870-526-2604, or send mail to P.O. Box 306, Kaiser, Arkansas, 72351. 
We'd love to see you soon. Thanks again for joining us, and may God bless you. Oh